Hello everyone, happy LGBT History Month 2021. Um, my name is Jo Somerset, I'm a writer and historian and I'm talking to you from my office in Manchester. Um, and for this year's celebration I'm going to tell uh, the story, the life story of Morley Clark who was a tailor in Leicester and whose life really exemplifies um, the experience of gay men throughout the 20th century. In his long life he saw many changes um, that, have, that affected the, uh, the lives of homosexual men as they were called. So Morley, um, by day he made men's suits and by night he sewed ball, ball gowns for his homosexual friends. And his partner, Roland Spence, ran a bookshop a few doors away from Morley's shop in Hotel Street in the city centre. So living as, as gay men in the 20th century, their lives was really shrouded in secrets and mysteries. So during this talk, we'll look at some of those secrets, some of those hidden lives and the code that they were forced to live by um, and also the very private resistance of his story. Morley came from a long line of clerks in Leicestershire uh, and there's a huge family of clerks still in existence living in Leicestershire. His grandfather Hepras Clark was a boot maker and is buried at Anstey. And Leicester is well known for its boot and hosiery uh, industry and also um, for the dressmaking and tailoring and clothing industry even today. One branch of the family founded Clark's shoe boxes which still exists in Colville. I talked to Morley's relatives who are highlighted here. His cousin once removed Liz Clark who herself a lesbian, developed a strong relationship with Morley during her adult life. Also, Liz's half-sister, Georgie Clark, who, like Liz and Morley, is gay. And finally, I spoke to Liz's son, who bears Morley's name, but isn't gay. Um, and, um, but doing, doing this work, piecing this story together, it's been an act of LGBT assertiveness in itself. Our blended family isn't in the traditional family tree. So I, here I am, I've created a, an LGBT version of a family tree and included myself in yellow. Um, here I am, I'm actually Liz Clark's civil partner. So I'm now claiming Morley as my own distant relative, united by civil partnership. Fishing around in the inner lives of, of two very private men, I've pieced together a life from Roland's diaries, seen here, from letters, interviews with his living relatives, as I've mentioned, also from birth and death certificates and newspaper cuttings. Thank you to Leicestershire Record Office for providing these. Um, and from photos, paintings and other objects that uh, Liz and her sons retrieved from Morley's house after his death. So, as I said, doing LGBT history is often a matter of reading between the lines. The diaries, though they're full of words, actually leave so much unsaid. And so, like all LGBT plus history, I've had to speculate to fill in the gaps. So, on with the story. Here's young Morley. What was it like to grow up as a gay man in the 20th century with, with your life conducted largely in code? When Morley was born during the First World War, talkie films hadn't even been invented yet. They were still on silent movies. Deliveries were still made by horse-drawn vehicles, at least some of them. And homosexuals could be birched, that's whipped with a bunch of twigs, if they were caught and prosecuted by the courts. In 1967, when Morley was 51, homosexuality was partly decriminalised between two consenting adults over 21 in private, but only in England and Wales. By the time he died, 
LGBT people could have a civil partnership and not long afterwards uh, people like himself and Roland could have got married. But during the 20th century life was gay life was full of mystery. Here's a picture of Roland's diary when he was 17. He knew he was gay but he never admitted it. Uh, but we can tell because he absolutely swooned after going to see Ivor Novello acting in, th in a play in, in um, London. Uh, and he was a young, gorgeous actor. On this page on Roland's diary, he's marked off various dates with crosses. And in the corresponding date in the actual diary, there's a tick. What does this secret code mean? I'm sure it's something to do with his passions or experiences as a teenager, but we don't know. So we don't know much about Morley's early life growing up in Leicester. Um, he would have completed a five year apprenticeship working in the busy city centre like like this picture. Um, not long after this, well, in 1939 came the Second World War and there was a, a terrible bombing uh, blitz on the 19th of November 1940, which killed 108 people. Living in Bembridge Street, um, Ro uh, Morley would have definitely been aware of and heard what was going on. And actually from Leicester, a few days before, they could see the orange glow from the Coventry blitz that had happened uh, 30 or 40 miles away. Um, we knew Roland was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force, during the Second World War, but we're not sure about Morley. There's a kind of hint that he wasn't allowed to, to go into the army. Maybe he was rejected as a lavender boy, like the flamboyant, effeminate L Londoner, Quentin Crisp, who was declared exempt by the Army Medical Board on the grounds of suffering from sexual perversion. Um, however, I do like to think that um, the liaisons that Morley had during the war, like here, he's there with a man in um, uniform. I'd like to think they were more than pals and that he could have had some um, nice, fruitful and fun relationships during the time when, uh, when cities were blacked out against invading bombers. But when Morley met the love of his life, probably in the late 1940s, having, and this is Roland, um, having a male lover was dangerous, requiring the utmost secrecy. So when we catch up with Morley in 1955, here's a brown shop sign above the door at 2 Hotel Street, H.M. Clark, ladies and gents, Taylor. It was at the, the, here's a modern picture of Hotel Street. So there's the shop that would have been Morley's at that time. Imagine to have his own place at the age of 38, a door that he could close on the prying eyes of the outside world. Well, yeah, let's just imagine it. Morley loved his trade. He took great pleasure in getting everything just so. He, um, we still have his ruler, which is called a trouser stretcher, ruler come trouser stretcher, which is which is stamped WB James and Co. Taylor's 35B Gallo Tree Gate, Leicester. Maybe that's where he worked his apprenticeship. Morley would have been in his element with the innuendo that shimmered in his industry. Men were used to having their inside leg measured, whereas now we'd giggle at the thought of a man kneeling close to a customer's thigh, extending his tape measure from ankle to crotch. Now, we know that Morley inducted in, 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 was involved in some kind of secrecy in his tailoring trade. Certainly he made suits. We don't exactly know what else he made for his friends, but it was bound to have been st some things that were stylish and glamorous like these. So what was it like to be a gay man in the 1950s and 60s? Um, Leicester's gay men met in the basement bar of the Grand Hotel, probably once a month. 
where they could uh, socialise relatively freely. This was at a time when thousands of gay men were in prison for buggery and great gross indecency, often after police entrapment. And the map here is from the Metropolitan Police and it's marked off with public toilets, cottages, where the police would swoop and the overrest men who were having sex. One Londoner wrote to his MP about the life of fear and dread we live all the time in case our friends find out or we are caught. And this man was caught, so he was now living in hell. The medical profession was fixated on fixated on treatments like um, electric shock and aversion therapy. And Alan Turing here on the bottom left, he was he was found guilty of gross indecency. Um, he's the guy who invented the world's first computer and was now is now famous for the code breaking that he did during the Second World War. Some people say he saved the war. Um, but he was found guilty and he accepted a punishment of being chemically castrated, so injected with oestrogen. And that mucked up his his brain. He couldn't really work anymore and he was a brilliant mathematician, so um, he committed suicide. Although there are some questions about whether it actually was suicide, but um, that's all we know for now. Um, so... The trials of famous men wreaked havoc on their lives. Even the Lovey Theatre establishment was not safe. The actor Sir John Gielgud, who was adored by Morley and his circle, had a nervous breakdown after his conviction for importuning for moral, immoral purposes in 1953. But then, shortly after this, Gielgud received a standing ovation from a supportive theatre audience. So things were changing. Following Lord Montague's imprisonment in 1954, which, which got front page headlines in the Daily Mirror, a government report known as the Wolfenden Report in 1957 recommended that homosexuality should be made legal, but it was to be another 10 years before limited decriminalisation was passed, and as I said, only in England and Wales. And on the right, even after 1967, <coughs> it was still difficult. You can see on the right there um, a picture of a man from who's being um, featured in gay news and he's talking about his experiences of queer bashing when he was a, a teenager in Glasgow. It was common for men to experience inner turmoil. Roland couldn't even verbalise his gayness in the diary, in his diary, and he used euphemisms even to himself about, he called it, the problem. He used a metaphor of being imprisoned. He said, there seems no end to the problem. That is only one's own mind closing one in within one's own four cell walls, expressing a disturbing sense of self-loathing when he feels condemned to mill around in a stinking black pit. So amidst all this atmosphere of secrecy and self-doubt, Morley received a telegram, which was, he, which was sent when he opened the shop. And it says, despite personal disappointment, wish you every success in the new venture, both now and always. Fondest regards, Richard. Who was Richard? It sounds like a previous employer. I suppose in a, in a small city like Leicester, in what we now call the gay community, everyone knew each other. So having a secret knowledge of your colleague's sexuality would have created an extra bond and often expressed with fondness. It can be tempting to think of those times as joyless, but actually Liz Clark doesn't uh, describe Morley's life as drab or miserable. His enjoyment of life was populated by colourful characters, and one of his customers uh, was this chap, Frederick Quinney Lawson, who wrote to him on his uh, embossed card. He was called Rick for short, 
um, and he was a wealthy student from Salt Lake City in the USA. Dear Clark, he says, you simply would not believe the number of compliments I've had on the suit. And he's recommended Morley to James Crompton and his friend, Mr. Hewitt. So we can guess about the nature of the friendship. Rick eventually became a red-robed dean of St. Mark's Cathedral in Salt Lake City in 1990. But before this, he learnt deep sea diving while working as a chaplain on a cruise ship. Lots of hints here. And subsequently, he worked underwater on David Attenborough's Blue Planet series. Back in Salt Lake City, his family um, gave loads of money to different public institutions. So then they were named after them. And to name just two, there's the Frederick Quinney Lawson Ballet Academy, another hint, and Janet Quinney Lawson Theatre. That was his mother. And let's take a look at his mother. Do you remember, I said, read between the lines. There are several pointers to Janet Quinney Lawson being like one of us, including this statue of her at the Utah State University. Look at her short hair, her dikey trouser suit, her hand on hip and assertive stance. I'm just saying. Let's get back to Morley's story. Um, well, here we are, a bookshop on Hotel Street called Clark and Satchel, no relation to Morley, was being run by Roland Spence, Morley's affair. By day, a bookseller. By night, he was an amateur actor. I like to think of a frisson between the two of them, maybe when Roland visited the tailor to have his inner leg measured. Or maybe Morley eyed up Roland in his new job at the bookshop when he went to buy a birthday card for his mother. Either way, we know a little about their secret trysts. According to Liz Clark, there was a lover's lane in en Enderby, near the farm where Roland had lived with his family, where they met to, well, love. Um, they definitely got to know each other at the Little Theatre. They both had a lifelong love of theatre and music. And when they eventually lived together, the walls of their house in Narborough would be festooned with signed photographs of actors and actresses and framed theatre programmes. And in this picture, which is a modern picture, over the road you can see is still standing is the, and still very popular is the Dover Castle, which is quite possibly Britain's oldest gay pub. It's been functioning since 1829. So acting must have given them the freedom they could not enjoy in daily life, pretending they were pretending, but they weren't. That's who they really were, dressed up, lipsticked and powdered, wearing jewels at, at some points. In June 1939, Roland is in Chekhov's comedy called The Bear. That's on the left here. And then 10 years later, here's Morley pictured in a play called Rope. But the article says, Doing his best with the difficult part of the poet who guesses the crime has, has been committed was Morley Clark. Sometimes his philosophical speeches ran away with him. Critics, eh? Hey? But they became stalwarts of the, of the theatre and carried on with it for another 30 or so years. Looking at this photo of Morley wearing a Roman tunic, Liz said he probably liked wearing that little skirt. Having a community like that must have been such an important part of life back then, where you could perform, but also relax backstage and at after show parties, which spilled over into the Dover Castle pub. Pop, as I've said, it was just across the road. So. The Little Theatre, it wasn't exclusively a male domain, but Morley had, you know, Morley had close female friends there. But the ability for these men to be themselves, I love this photo, to be free in body, mind and spirit. It must have been a heady mixture in those times. And there's Roland draped in between the two uh, men standing at the back. So 
time's rolling on. We're getting some answers. Look at this picture. They are definitely a couple. They loved going on holiday. And in their many holidays abroad, Sitges, uh, which is a gay resort near Barcelona and still is, it was a favourite. Roland um, took pride in taking picture, um, painting pictures in his sketchbook um, and they absolutely reveled in the, the joy of being anonymous and basking on beaches with very little on. They loved the body beauty. But it was not all joy, far from it. Roland's 1959 diary is full of anguish about whether he and Morley will ever be able to live together. In 1959, the time of this diary, Morley's mother, uh, father had just died and he was to carry on living with his mother until she died, which was 12 years later. Roland's yearning in his diary is mixed up with trying to support his dear lad who is torn by grief and a strong tie with his mother but the deadliness with which she demanded to know whether and he, this is how he said she demanded to know whether I should be at 174 Glenfield Road which is where she and Morley lived on Sunday for dinner was utterly intolerable the deadliness with which she demanded to know it in modern day times, too many of us still have to endure hostility at our choice of partner. But in those days, it was pretty much everyone. And it was to be another 12 years before Lily's death freed them from this maternal yoke and they could get a place together. But then they did. So here we are. After 22 years as a couple, they found their dream house in Narborough. Finally, nothing was stopping them from privately living the lover's life together that they'd yearned for. A walled garden, which you can see at the back there, meant their privacy was protected and they became notorious for their parties. Morley was the giggly funny one, while Roland was more quieter and more serious. They also had good friends in the village where they're called, some people have called this the glass closet, where no one mentions it, but everybody knows. I can imagine Morley at home in the kitchen, wearing his apron, baking cakes or making a batch of jam for the neighbours. On other days, he'd be in the garden room, the extension that they built, sewing his sewing machine whirring, converting a mountain of satin into ruffles and flounces, then painstakingly attaching each sequin until it got too much for his arthritic fingers and squinting eyes, which was, I have to say, well into his 80s. In a situation where there was complete separation between day job and nightlife, Morley found a way to embody his self-identity. He was a natty dresser and his manners matched his elegant slacks and flowery shirts, always the perfect gentleman. His movements were graceful. He knew all the dance steps. His daytime behaviour was just short of camp, but in a safe environment, he went over the top. A bit like Kenneth Williams in the Carry On films, if you know those, said Liz. Who knows what spirit was unleashed in private? But life, time, times moved on. And the de debate started about whether and how people should come out. In the early 70s, the days of Gay Liberation Front, um, Morley and Roland certainly had uh, friends who were younger, but we think they probably would have considered all this rather vulgar behaviour. By the time they both retired in 1976, they were in their 60s. Gay activism was sn snowballing. But Morley and Roland were an elegant, older gay couple living in a world of refinement. Their old style language and vocabulary must have jarred with the younger generation. As gay experience unfolded during the 1980s, Liz is sure that Morley and Roland would have known the younger, more strident crowd. They had friends of all ages, but their close circle still held to the old values, calling each other she and having friends, having couples who had female nicknames like Phyllis and Dillis. 
copious cross-dressing, adoration of 1950s films starring gorgeous hunk Rock Hudson or rapturously applauding Russian ballet star Rudolf Nureyev. In 1982, this was the year when W.H. Smith finally agreed to sell gay news after um, a, a widespread gay boycott of the shop, when homosexuality was finally decriminalised in Northern Ireland, when Leicester's helpline received public funding, and sadly, when Terence Higgins died of what the newspapers call the gay plague. The threat of AIDS in the 1980s and 90s, which we've recently been reminded of and had pictured so fantastically on the television series, It's a Sin. It doesn't seem to have affected Morley directly, but he must have known people who were. We get the impression that Morley and Roland were a monogamous couple, and most of their friends were also settled older couples. But Rock Hudson's death in 1985 and Rudolf Noyevs in 1993 from AIDS were unsettling. But their relationship was still completely unacknowledged by family, and indeed to come out publicly would have been unthinkable for both of them. So when Roland unexpectedly died, an article in the local newspaper, which is entitled Former City Bookseller Dies Age 65, just referred to, to Roland as single. The death notice in the newspaper that was placed there by Roland's family only mentions Morley as a friend at the bottom of the relationship hierarchy after mother, sister and nephew. Despite their decades together, Roland's family descended on his home that he had with them um, uh, in Narborough and stripped it of Roland's belongings, including his precious collection of ivory figures. They completely ignored the fact that Morley and Roland had been a couple and this was their home and these were Morley's things as much as Roland's. Morley had neither legal rights nor the moral confidence to assert his ownership of his, his lover's possessions. Liz was aghast she was age 20. She had friends in similar circumstances whose families had denied their gayness, friends who died of AIDS and had, whose families had lied on their death certificates. But 28 years later, Liz got her own back after Morley died when he was 93. At his funeral wake in the Grand Hotel, there was a collection for Stonewall for LGBT equal rights. And at that time, they were campaigning for equal marriage. Liz wanted to out him to all those prim and proper people who had ignored uh, the love of his life. She was determined to get recognition for Morley and Roland, and she scattered his ashes at the Lover's Lane in Enderby. So, looking at Morley's life, we know now how important pride is. Being involved in the little theatre was a halfway house, between the unforgiving heterosexual and what we now call heteronormative world and the underground gay brotherhood. Here he found a community which wasn't exclusively male, which accepted him as he, as he was, where he could be proud, flamboyant, outrageous, the sort of thing we see nowadays on pride parades. We acknowledge how difficult it was for our, ancestors, our gay ancestors to locate that pride. It was so deeply buried and to find places where they could find that fusion of body, mind and spirit to be simply unashamedly proud of who they were without fear of repercussions. These days, Morley's relatives are proud and open. Three generations of Clark gay women aged 58, 32, 30 and 16 look back with pride. Here's Georgie Clark. She loves having Morley's shop sign on display in her home. It makes me feel incredibly proud, she says. She doesn't remember meeting Morley as a baby, but she says it's incredibly important to have strong role models like this, even if they are somewhat imaginary, so that being gay doesn't feel like a setback in life. 
Liz Clark, who had such a close relationship with Morley and really cared for him uh, in his much later older years. She's got the pot from his front garden is now in her front garden and the ruler that I've talked about. Um, she's very, she says she's very proud and she even named her youngest son after him. And let's take a look at the youngest son. Here he is, Jack Morley Hartshorn. He's proud of his name and proud to provide the continuity with Morley by wearing his signet ring. And Jack just says, uh, Morley was an amazing person and obviously someone who's had a huge influence on my mum and on our family, so respect. So let's just reflect really on LGBT history. It's in the past, but it's simultaneously with us in the present. Emphasising pride capsizes the shame that Morley's generation and my contemporaries in the 1970s were made to feel. But it also highlights the irrepressible flamboyant fountain of joy and love in which many, admittedly not all, but many LGBT plus people bathed as an act of resistance. This portrait of Morley Clark that I've, that I've given tells um, a kind of rounder, gives a rounder view of the persecution of, of homosexuals during the 20th century. In, this was a century of secrets and mystery, but also love and defiance. It shows us the importance of having a survival strategy, in their case, the theatre. And those with Morley's name today can trace their gay ancestry with pride. If he could have been open about his relationship with Roland, even got married, his life would have been so different. But nevertheless, it was still a life characterised by fun, affection for his friends and deep love. Or to quote Morley, it really is true to say that life consists not in holding good cards, but in playing those that you do hold well. Thank you for listening and thank you to everybody who's helped to make this, um, uh, help me to tell this story of Roland, uh, of Morley and Roland. And uh, I'll just finish off by saying, if you've got any questions or any comments, um, please feel free to ask them in whichever uh, format you're, you're seeing this presentation. Uh, and so we'll say goodbye to Morley for now. Goodbye.